Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 363. We are talking about seasteading today. This is cutting-edge liberty stuff, my friends. Seasteading, well, you know what? I'm going to let Joe Quirk tell you all about seasteading. But I guarantee you, you are going to find this an interesting and compelling conversation. Joe Quirk is Director of Communications at the Seasteading Institute, which was founded in 2008. You can visit them at seasteading.org, and I can almost guarantee you're going to want to do that after you hear my discussion with Joe Quirk. And this is a strikingly original idea to try out liberty that really people hadn't been talking about up until the Seasteading Institute was founded, and even then people laughed it off, and now they're really moving forward with it. Very, very interesting stuff. Everything we're talking about, the Seasteading Institute, the their uh, videos with Joe Quirk talking about these various projects, there are other links that will help you to understand this subject better. All this stuff will be collected and available for you at tomwoods.com slash 363, the show notes page for today. So here's my conversation with Joe Quirk. I hope you enjoy it. Joe, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. What a topic this is, seasteading. I, when I first heard about it years ago, I hope you'll forgive me for thinking that it was only half serious, that you know, people are desperate and they'll try anything at this point, libertarians. You know, we've tried everything else. And I remember hearing Patry Friedman talk about it at a conference in Brazil that I attended. And at one point he said something along the lines of, look, if you think seasteading is unrealistic, try every other strategy the libertarians have attempted over the years, not one of which has worked before you lecture me about how unrealistic seasteading is. All right, fair enough. But now you've actually got I just watched a video that you did where you spell out exactly how it would work and what the design would be like and how much it would cost and what the relationship would be like with uh, with coastal nations nearby. I mean, you guys have taken this from what might have at one time been a pie-in-the-sky idea to something eminently practical. Can you, Before we even get started, comment on that. Yeah, it's not a crazy idea at all. If you, if you think about cruise ships, cruise ships are basically floating skyscrapers. Uh, and anything you do on land, people are doing on cruise ships. And the Dutch are already building floating parks and floating pavilions and plo- floating apartment houses. And the technology for floating cities is rapidly approaching. And if you think about the fact that we walked on the moon 45 years ago, and if you think space stations are expensive, imagine how cheap a sea station would be. And we see uh, seasteading as a rapidly approaching technology that will let uh, future governments evolve with a speed akin to other technologies by providing a fluid market of governments competing to serve citizens. You know, not long ago, as a matter of fact, it was just last month, I was actually on a cruise ship with uh, a number of other people, including the economist Bob Murphy. And Bob and I over lunch were saying, of course, we knew all, all about seasteading already, but we were saying how interesting it is that there's almost everything you need on this ship— I mean, you know, you do stop at ports once in a while, and you can get on land and enjoy that. But basically, there's everything you need, except the internet quality could be better. But that's got to be only a matter of time at this point. And it made us. And plus, you realize when you're on a cruise ship, all the restrictions you're under with normal land-based governments. Because as soon as you set sail, you can buy tax-free goods. You can gamble in the casino. So. At some point, some libertarian was going to put two and two together and figure this whole thing out. Tell us about, first of all, define seasteading, and then I want you to talk about how this would work in relation to existing regimes. I guess I imagine seasteading as being a totally anarcho thing. You'd be out in the middle of the waters, and you you, you would be away from any sovereign territory that could impose its legal system on you. You're envisioning something a little different from that. So sort that all out for us. Well, seasteading is homesteading the high seas. And our plan is to build floating nations that can uh, disassemble and reassemble on the ocean according to the choices of the citizens. And we think this will prevent uh, government monopolies from forming and force governments to compete to attract citizens. And continuing on our theme of cruise ships, um, these are basically libertarian skyscrapers. I mean, they 
They dock in one nation, they incorporate in yet another nation, they fly the flag of yet another nation, they have friendly relations with nations all over the world and they move among them, and they kind of stick together these different labor laws from one place and, uh, uh, you know, customers from another place. And there, when I was on a cruise ship, I, I was walking around trying to do back of the napkin calculations for how they could have, how they could make this profitable because it was the best standard of living I'd ever had. It's like going camping and taking your mall with yeah. you. <laughs> and there's ice sculptures and there's people taking care of me and there's entertainment and it, and it's affordable for a middle-class American. Uh, and this sort of, once we am able, are able to build, say, permanent structures on the high seas that can float permanently, you realize these would be independent governments. They wouldn't dock anywhere else. And once you wrap your mind around the fact that 45% of the Earth's surface is completely unclaimed by any existing state, you realize you can have startup mobile governments on the ocean. And that insight started the seasteading movement. And now, it, you know, since Patry Freeman proposed this, it was he co founded the Seasteading Institute with Peter Thiel. And we've attracted marine biologists and nautical engineers and aquaculture farmers and maritime attorneys and medical researchers. It goes on and on and on. And probably at this point, at least a thousand people have donated to the Institute because they want to see startup governments on the ocean. It's such a but uh, Joe, it's such a good idea and such an interesting idea that I would hate to see happen to this what's happened basically all over the world that maybe here and there you start off with a pretty good idea but then the statists come around and before you know it it's just another government like every other place what kind of built-in safeguards are there to prevent that from happening if you imagine the ocean is so fundamentally different from land you have to think really deeply about why governments on the ocean would be different and i think the reason uh national governments are such so dysfunctional is because they're monopolies. I mean, some government just sort of claims a piece of land and all the people within it. You know, we're just sort of born into this nation formed by a previous conqueror, and then some government claims us. And then we can't switch to a competing provider if we don't like it. Uh, on the ocean, you're mobile. And if you can imagine, our plan is to create cities that are like mobile uh, jigsaw puzzles. They can fit together and detach according to the choices of the people who live there, according to the citizens. And we think this will create a market of competing governments where uh, governments will compete to attract mobile citizens. Uh, and if you get in a political fight, you can detach, uh, move somewhere else, link up with your allies and found your own floating nation. And we think this will accelerate the innovations uh, in governance, because right now we don't think 193 governments uh, represent the range of ideas that 7 billion people have produced. So seasteaders bring a, a startup sensibility to the problem of government monopolies that don't innovate sufficiently. And we think a market of competing services in governance will unleash uh, innovation. All right, we'll come back to that topic a little bit later. There's so many other things I want to make sure I get to. Of course, I'll be linking to seasteading.org on the show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 363. I will also link to your—you've uh, got about a two-and-a-half-minute video on floating cities that uh, spells out what you guys are up to. I'm going to link to that as well. I want to talk about a few other things. Let's talk for a minute about the maybe the, the technical aspect of things. Uh, sure. What is this going to look like, and how is it going to be built? I mean, these are questions that you guys have apparently looked into and answered. You've actually got estimates on how much per square foot the real estate is going to wind up being. Uh, flesh that out for us, if you would. I think it's going to happen in incremental steps. And the, in the immediate short term, uh, we've initiated our floating city project, which you can find at our website, and I encourage people to check out. And these will be modular platforms floating in the territorial waters of a host nation, uh, which is willing to grant us substantial political autonomy. And if you want to find people who know how to build large floating structures, you go to the Dutch, because 
Uh, Holland is sinking and the Dutch are learning how to float. And we've got a, a Dutch aquatic engineering firm known as Delta Sync, S-Y-N-C. And they've, you know, uh, created the feasibility project, uh, uh, the feasibility report for our floating city project. And I think that's in the short term. If we're able to demonstrate uh, a few floating platforms that can disassemble, reassemble, attach, and if we're able to create some jobs for the local people, if we're able to set a good example, uh, we think this will attract enough brains to seasteading to solve the uh, deeper engineering challenge of uh, floating cities on the high seas. Uh, the technology to build in shallow waters already exists. The technology to build floating structures that are affordable on the high seas uh, is, has yet to be solved, that problem. Now, you're talking about, and of course, we're just having a fun conversation here where we can talk, we can speculate wildly about the future. And I know I'm getting ahead of where you guys are now, but I'm just a curious person. Right now, you're talking about being in protected waters, working out some kind of arrangement with uh, coastal nations. Do you have? Do you ever imagine this getting to a point where you would be beyond the reach of a coastal nation, and somehow you would figure out exactly what, the, how the questions of sovereignty would resolve themselves? Yes, I mean we plan to create floating islands on the high seas beyond the jurisdiction of any government. Uh, and we think if these profits scale up, hire people, um, you know, there's, there was a floating airport in Japan uh, in, the, in, the, in the year 2000. If people are able to fly out there and these become cities um, beyond the jurisdiction of existing nations, sort of permanent, um, imagine two dozen uh, cruise ships all linking up and forming a city. Uh, once these people have a running economy and once children are born there, we think, uh, you know, the UN and other nations might be inclined to recognize them as sovereign nations. And we have all sorts of volunteer legal scholars uh, working on uh, uh, setting the, establishing sort of the legal precedents for why this could happen. Obviously, as you said, this is not an inexpensive undertaking. But on the other hand, if it works, it seems like it would it could generate quite a bit of revenue. Where does the startup capital come from? Right now, the people that are most interested uh, are people that are interested in the problem of governments and what they imagine they could do if they could start over. And there's lots of different uh, businesses that are interested in uh, new sovereign mobile nations. Uh, among them is, is um, medical tourism. You know, um, the islands surrounding the United States, like the Cayman Islands, they're already building uh, gigantic health cities, uh, planning on catching the rising wave of dissatisfied Americans flying overseas for better, cheaper, faster care. And a famous humanitarian uh, surgeon, Devi Shetty, he was in the news saying, you know, the best place to have a floating hospital would be uh, off the coast of a, an American city. And given that that doesn't exist, I'm going to the Cayman Islands. Uh, I think beyond that, I know lots of um, biotech entrepreneurs and stem cell physicians who are frustrated uh, by the regulations that are written in the 1970s preventing the kind of innovations they want to bring in 2020. And they are eager to get out from under this old gridlocked kind of sclerotic uh, system of regulations and start anew somewhere else. Um, and I think people little um, appreciate the power of starting over. I think of uh, Hong Kong as an example of a country that started over, created fabulous wealth and prosperity for people, and sort of embarrassed uh, China into changing its markets to be more open. I think of Singapore this way. Uh, I think of the Cayman Islands, which, which has no standing army and in many ways takes a, a sort of spiteful stance towards the U.S., you know, welcomes financial mavericks um, and, uh, and, and medical research entrepreneurs. Um, as long as you don't directly provoke large nations, they're not really incentivized uh, to invade. The way I always put it, you know, if, if nations are sharks, when you build your seastead, you want to think like a cleaner fish. 
You want to provide a service that the, the big nations find valuable. Um, and people are interested in aquaculture farms. Um, people are interested in mass uh, farming of the oceans. They think the future of food is in algae. Uh, people interested in uh, biofuel are interested in seasteading. And we're attracting environmentalists. The, 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 the sign that seasteading is a meta idea is in the diversity of solutions that people brought to us. You know, once Patry Friedman proposed this, you know, solutions we never imagined have been brought to us. Now, Joe, I realize we can take the cruise ship analogy only so far, but one valuable insight from the cruise ship analogy is that, as you described, it is an incredible world you walk into when you set foot on a cruise ship. As you say, it's com a completely self-contained society with entertainment and wonderful food and people at your beck and call, and it's, uh, and it's beautifully decorated and you feel very comfortable. But notice that this is the, we don't sit on a cruise ship and think to ourselves, well, what kind of system of governance do they have? Do they have a constitution? Are they electing, uh, uh, you know, selectmen? Do they have a governor? It's a private company that runs that cruise ship, and I think that's part of the reason that we enjoy being on board. Now, why can't the the seasteading thing be thought of in terms of? A company, a private company, runs this uh, this place, and if if you think, of course, all the progressive websites would be horrified. Well, they don't have to live there. You can move away if you yes. don't like it. Why not think along that model instead of thinking, well, let's try and have a slightly better example of what hasn't worked at all on land. Namely, we'll come up with some constitution and try and start over again. Forget starting over again. Let's really start over and try something that humanity should have tried a long time ago, which is just a purely voluntary society. What about that? At this point, most seasteaders uh, support the kind of thing you just proposed. Um, I, I've been on two cruise ships. Uh, I never saw a, a, a cop. <laughs> I never saw an enforcer. Uh, they do have ships all over the world have their own security, their own private security. Um, they have they bring their own private health care along. Before you get on this cruise ship, you sign uh, something with the private company saying they're going to take care of your health care. Uh, they're going to assure that your food is safe. Uh, I, I think we could easily have such a diversity of arrangements on the ocean if you just provide the technology for people to start their own sort of independent um, societies on the sea, I think unimaginable solutions will emerge. And I would like to see exactly what you proposed. And now tell me, I saw this video that, as I said, I'm going to link to at tomwoods.com slash 363, in which you matter-of-factly point out that there have already been talks or talks are ongoing with various coastal nations about working out some type of mutually satisfactory arrangement. I, I realize that you obviously can't disclose any specifics about that, but... Yet, what, what can you tell us about that? Most people don't realize that legal islands within existing states are, are being created all over the world. They're called special economic zones. They come under various names, leap zones, elevator cities. You know, you had Michael Strong on your show uh, not long ago. He, he, he's interested in elevator cities. Um, so many uh, nations that recognize that... Um, solutions emerge from startups are willing to allow little kind of legal islands within their country. Um, and this is going on all over Asia and in India and in South America. And the kind of nations that already have um, legislation to allow special economic zones are open to the idea of us coming to them and saying, hey, we don't even need any land. We'll make our own land just offshore. Technically, will be within your territorial waters, but maybe you could uh, arrange for us to have some measure of political autonomy. And we promise that we'll do our best to create some prosperity and hire some local people and maybe create some blue jobs. And um, many uh, nations are open to this idea. So we're kind of in various stages of negotiation with several. I note here in my notes that you and Patry Friedman have a book coming out next year to be published by Simon & Schuster, which is wonderful because, of course, Simon & Schuster is a big, big, major publisher, which which naturally elevates 
any book in terms of significance and visibility and credibility, very, very important. So I think for a case in a case like this, it makes sense not to self-publish, even though I've been singing the praises of that because I self-published my most recent book. In this case, I would do exactly what you're doing. The book, the title that I have here in my notes is Why Seastead? How Floating Nations Will Liberate Humanity. Can you say a word about that? Because, of course, when that comes out, I'd like to have one of you guys back on. And often proposed titles change, so you're aware of this. These things might change over time. But we think um, people are, you know, Pottery comes from a family of people who've been innovating in how uh, governance could work um, for, you know, decades. Uh, David Friedman has written very interesting ideas for how anarcho-capitalist societies could work. Lots of people would like to try these ideas. You know, Milton Friedman put tons of his uh, effort into explaining to people the power of, of markets and to talk them out of, out of their, you know, counter, you know, talk them into counterintuitive conclusions about what causes prosperity. But the problem is there's just no way to try these ideas. Um, people are thinking of all sorts of ways, uh, you know, that new societies can be created. And if you think the United States was designed when information traveled at the speed of a horse, before there were cars, before there was electricity, we have lots of modern ideas that, that could be tried out. And we'd like to provide the platforms for uh, people to try them, to unleash the innovation. We'd like to see um, innovators unleashed from the monopolies that prevent them from trying their ideas. Well, it's all very exciting, and I want to urge people to check out seasteading.org to get your newsletter, to follow what you guys are up to. As I said, when that book comes out, I'd love to talk to you guys again. I'm going to collect all the various resources we've been talking about on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 363. Joe Quirk, uh, this has been—I think this is one of my favorite conversations I've had, and this is episode number 363, so I'm really grateful for your time today. A lot of fun. Tom, I really appreciate what you do, and I'm honored that you invited me. All right, everybody, two things here. Remember, TomWoods.com slash 363 has a bunch of links uh, Joe himself sent me. So we're going to put that up there, all those things up there, so you can get more information about all this. TomWoods.com slash 363, once again, is that page. And I personally think this was a fantastic episode. I can't say enough about it. And if you agree and you feel like this uh, show is benefiting you, uh, please consider joining the elite and warming my heart by becoming a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com. You get lots and lots of goodies. I mean, a ton, a ridiculous ton of goodies. This ain't no PBS umbrella. Well, you see all the things I'm giving you guys over at supportinglisteners.com as a thank you for helping me to continue doing this show Monday through Friday. And speaking of which, we will be starting it all over again, a whole new week of programming Monday through Friday, starting next week. So enjoy your weekend. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.